Dr. Givard, um, yesterday you held a session or a presentation in the session Management of Difficult Chronic Rhinosinusitis. Could you just summarize your main talking points? Yeah. Chronic sinusitis is a disease actually with two kind of diseases inside or a spectrum of disease. On one hand you have chronic sinusitis and on the other hand you have chronic sinusitis with nasal polyps and they are a little bit different in disease. What is the difference is that patients with chronic sinusitis mainly have headache and a blocked nose and post-nasal drip. And if you look in the nose, you see these secretions, you see some swelling. On the other hand, you have chronic sinusitis with nasal polyp. They mainly have no smell and they have, when you look in the nose, you have these growing polyps that are there. This last group has more symptoms and especially is associated with severe late onset asthma and it's a difficult to treat disease. So yesterday, the topic was this difficult to treat uh, chronic sinusitis patients. The first topic was about the use of steroids, corticosteroids. You have local corticosteroids, they are good and safe. You have them in sprays and drops. You can use them lifelong, they have no side effects and they can be used safely in all the diseases and there is good evidence to use them. On the other hand, if that doesn't is enough to help your patient, then quite often doctors take back to systemic corticoids, uh, injections or pills with systemic corticoids. If you look for the evidence there, there is not too much evidence that it works. However, there is a lot of evidence that they have a lot of side effects. It is not a problem when you use it in an acute situation where you have to help to help your patient with an exacerbation or with it at that moment a problem but for a long time treatment because chronic sinusitis chronic is a chronic disease it's for long term they are not of help and they cause too much side effects if you use them long term so the session was actually to because we had a task force where we want to write or where, where we finish the position paper that will be published soon where we look into this kind of uh, harm and side effects of systemic corticoids because many doctors still use too much to my opinion systemic corticoids for this kind of disease now the question is what can we do better what is the better way then to treat well of course the first thing is always does the patient use the right medication? I think that's the first step. If that is all done, I think we have to move on further. And the second speaker was Claire Hopkins from London, and she looked into surgery. And she looked into surgery that actually early surgery and selection of patients for surgery is important. Why? Because if you do surgery and you have a sinus problem, you open up the sinuses and the local corticoids can get there. So this is a good way to have a better access of local corticoids in the sinuses. And I think it's very important at an allergy congress and an immunology congress that we explain as ENT surgeons why this is important, is to have the local drug having an effect locally in the sinuses. So that's why we do sinus surgery. And actually the results look very good. If you have an early intervention, you can even present of going on for asthma and more extensive disease. So I think for difficult patients, we still have to think about the need of surgery. However, we know for patients with nasal polyps that even if you do surgery, that a large group, the polyps keep on returning and you need revision surgeries. For those patients, we need better treatment options. And therefore, there was a third talk about, uh, from Peter Hellings. Peter Hellings talked about precision medicine, endotyping, phenotyping of the patients. So what we do there is, you have your patient and you will look which patient, or try to predict which patient will have the worst outcome. And based on what you find in the patient, you can maybe predict in a better way which patient to select for biologicals. At this moment, there is a growing interest in nasal polyps and the use of biologicals, monoclonal antibodies, anti-L5, anti-IgE, anti-L4 and 13 receptor antagonists coming up in big trials and having nice data in nasal polyps. It's not registered yet, but we hope that soon it will be. And so we see there is a good effect. These treatments, come with a considerable cost. So we have to choose the right patient. And this is what it's all about, is trying to predict which patient will have a bad outcome, will need several surgeries. And if we can predict them beforehand, 
then we can select those patients and treat them early on also with the biologicals. We do have some experience with the biologicals because patients with severe asthma are already on these biologicals and from these biologicals used in daily practice we already know that we have uh, an effect in controlling symptoms not only of asthma but also of the nose. And that is my last message. Nasopolyp patients quite often have asthma. So we as ENT surgeons, we work together with lung physicians. Why? Because it's the same disease. The nose and the lung are together. These treatments also work together. So if you treat the nose well, the lung will be better. But also the monoclonals work both on lung and nose. So we have a big interest in working together and being here at the Yaki Congress and sit together and to work out better plans for the future of the patient. Two questions. Um, one is the task force is um, preparing this paper on recommendation also for practitioners on how what treatment might be best for patients with chronic um, rhinositis, if I understand correctly. What's your plan of um, distributing this paper so that actually every doctor gets to see it so that they were informed about the new options and second questions you said that you know um, new ways of treatments like treatments with biological comes come at a significant cost um, how um, how far are we in the possibilities to do um, endo and phenotyping for individual patients I mean how many doctors do have those kind of options yeah, yeah. I think I have to uh, go back to the first question the, the first question is all about um, the task force. We had a task force and we are preparing a position paper on the harm and the benefit of systemic corticoids. This is only about this little aspect because we see that systemic corticoids have an advantage in some places but you should not use it chronically. So this is a review, a meta-analysis, where we really look into detail what is the place or, and the evidence of systemic corticoids in treatment of upper airway disease. For the full treatment scheme, I refer to another working group, which is the EPOS guidelines. The EPOS guidelines uh, started already in 2006. There was an update in 2012. That's the European position paper on sinusitis and nasal polyps. And that is now working on a new document for 2020. So this will be the broader guidelines where we have everything inside. The task force we are talking about is just about the harm and the benefits of systemic corticoids to give them a place. It's a small branch of the treatment, but we wanted to look in that because it's much uh, more used than it should be, to my opinion. So the task force focuses on that, it's a small branch. The second question is about endotyping and phenotyping. Endotyping and phenotyping can be done in a lab of very good established centers. Like in Ghent, we endotype and phenotype all our patients. But what is interesting is that we try to couple the endotype with the phenotype. So what we do, we measure everything what we find in the nose, in the tissue, in the nasal secretion, in the blood. We combine it and then with cluster analysis there is a great work of uh, Peter Thomasen from the Gen group and he put this whole data together and there you can link the endotype to the phenotype. Generally what this says is that if you have a type 1 inflammation you have a more chance to have a chronic sinusitis and no asthma if you have a type 2 inflammation with high IgE and eosinophils, you have a higher chance of having nasal polyps and asthma together. So based actually on the phenotype, you can more or less predict the endotype. So it's all about making a, comp a link between the phenotype and the endotype. I think the minimal thing you should do on top of phenotyping just by asking and looking in the nose whether there are polyps and whether there is asthma asking questions is of course you can look for IgE, uh, for eosinophils, both the serum maybe also in the nose and these are not so difficult things. One last question, especially uh, in the field of allergy you are uh, dealing with a lot of data and different patients with 
um, different symptoms and also different allergies. How much is um, artificial intelligence already helping you now and how can the ways of assembling big data efficiently help you in the future? Yeah. I think today we are coming into a new era. I think the era of connecting data, of big data, of artificial intelligence is coming. We don't have it yet, at least not in experimental settings. We have many digital files in the hospital. We have many data of the patient from the GP, from the specialist, from what we take in the blood, from the environment of the patient, from what the watch of the patient is telling, from what the patient is telling himself, what the patient is feeling. And we put them all in one system. Every country, every hospital has this own health file where they try to centralize it. But these health files, at this moment, they don't do anything with it. What we do as doctors, we look into it and we look and we read into patient's file and we connect ourselves. Of course, as soon as computers start to do that, they can connect and inter do an interpretation of the data that are in the computers, we will enter the new era. At this stage, we don't use artificial intelligence yet as it should be. But I'm a strong believer that in the near future, by connecting all these data, measurements wherever, whatever, environment, in your blood, letters from doctors, it will all be combined and the computer will start thinking and use it. Will it replace the doctor is the next question. Well, it won't, because you always will need someone in between the computer and you to have the interpretation, but it will help, especially GPs and doctors to say, well, there is something going on in this patient. Maybe this patient needs her urgent help. Maybe we can see when a patient is going back even one or two days because he, before he would normally turn to the emergency room because we would see that things are already changing. So I think artificial intelligence will come. It will help us to predict also how to use treatments, how to use expensive treatments in some patients. And we are now at a moment where it's changing, but it's not yet there and we don't use it yet. The question is, will it replace doctors? Again, I think it's not. The doctor will be the interface between the computer and the human being, the patient. And patients will always want to hear the explanation of a doctor. Also, doctors have the gut feeling. And the gut feeling is quite often superior than what any computers tell you. You can also tell it in a different way, you have an understanding. So we will be for long necessary as medical doctors. However, I do believe that at maybe in a longer term, medical doctors will be a luxury for rich patients. And maybe the more poor will have more help of computers than the more rich one. And this is maybe a sad part of my story. I think artificial intelligence will, especially in underdevelopment countries, will help poor patients in a better way. And in richer countries, we will have the luxury of paying a doctor that is giving the warmth and the interpretation of these data. But it will change our medical field. Dr. Givat, thank you so much for all your insights.